it's a good thing to do for some people. So, right, let's crack on, shall we? So uh, everything I've got here for us that we can talk about, um, it's all available to download already. So if you do want to skip along to my website and how to sign electronics, um, you'll find these slides there already. And there is a tiny bit of code there as well, but nothing terribly exciting. And this will be this link will be up when we have a two minute break. So you can always grab it then um, with a pen and paper. So <clears throat> this, this little session is all about um, co-processors using the Raspberry Pi Pico. And co-processors, um, if anyone, you know, of the 1990s who had a PC may have had a, like a 486DX2 um, for the red Pentiums. And uh, having a co-processor is all about just number crunching. So if you've got a lot of numbers, it's having another way of getting through all that information to get a number out <clears throat> and leaving the main processor to do whatever else it's got to do. So just lightening the burden. And as I've mentioned before, it's really easy to forget that these Raspberry Pi Picos, that only a dual M0 plus, the most basic of microcontrollers, and yet it does punches so far above its weight I, for one, I'm quite impressed. So we're going to have a look at <clears throat> analog coprocessors. So I've got some stuff on doing it in the analog world. And then <clears throat> after we've had a two minute break and I've got my voice back, um, we'll have a look into doing it digitally. So uh, two little things for us to play with. So this is just a very brief list of the type of things as to why would I even want to have a coprocessor. And in a nutshell, I think the top two points here, uh, if you're analyzing a signal coming in, say audio, for example, or vibration, or last time we were looking at um, proximity, that's a continuous data stream coming in. So it can be quite a good idea to offload that continuous processing onto another chip or as we said here <clears throat> if it's time critical if you're having some some massive data that's like i'm doing stuff with wind turbines uh, it's kind of time critical if there's going to be a problem with the brakes or some vibration problem so being able to number crunch all those things and and the other list here i mean we're not going to go into all of these um it's just an idea of the sort of things you can do. And certainly with the Raspberry Pi P Pico, you've only got three ADC ports. So being able to offload <clears throat> from the main processor, if you say you had four or five, how are you going to get those others into the Pico? So by using something like an analog we're going to look at first, uh, which is the more complicated of the two, but I thought we'd do it first. Um, we can start to get an start to analyze and maybe get some numbers. And then those final results are what would then be piped to the main processor. And we'll have a look at some ideas on how we could do that. Um, uh, I've got a, a thought. Yeah. You are inject injectable. Um, so uh, an example of a coprocessor, um, kind of, um, on, on a board I've been making uh, that you might be aware of, um, I decided to introduce uh, uh, an AT Tiny uh, processor for the sole purpose of implementing uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, it, it, it it's, it's those um, uh, rotary encoder things. It's like a, a a knob that you can turn either way, but it's entirely digital. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason is that when you're doing rotary encoder stuff, you really, really, really need fairly high precision access to this um, uh, to the to digital inputs. And and I was trying to do this down the end of a of a rather long and and used um, I two C bus, um, and I decided that that was just not going to work. Mm -hmm. So. 
So basically, I've got a, a whole processor, a whole MCU for the whole purpose of being an I2C to rotary encoder interface. There you go. Perfect. And uh, I'm just, just thinking about some other examples. I think cars. How many micro processors are in a car these days? Um, I'm sure it's well over 50 these days. That's probably an underestimate. Probably. Um, the, the, the modern architecture for cars is to use what's called CAN bus, which is, strangely enough, car area network. <laughs> oh, there you go. I always wondered what it stood for. I thought it was communications or something, but it's C for car. There you go. Who, yeah. who, who would have thought? So some, some people call it controller area network, but, mm. but given that it all started in an automotive, I'm pretty sure it's car area. <laughs> there we go. Right. So let's 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 move on to try and keep keep the speed. So here's a picture of um, an actual analog computer. So we'll start with analog to start with, because it's, it's a little bit more come to get our head round and our brains are still hopefully still nice and fresh. So um, this is actually 1972. This was actually used, um, did a bit of research into this one's actually at the Museum of Computing over at Bletchley Park. And uh, if you haven't been over there, um, treat yourself to a day out and go and look at the amazing Colossus, you know, and the bomb and and all, and all the really cool electronics and um, computers that you can play with over there. So <clears throat> it's, it's easy to say that digital world has um, um, replaced the analog world. And um, probably in the 1980s, that might have been true. But I personally still think the analog electronics certainly when you're talking about small microcontrollers, have got a real place to pay. Well, place to play. I think I said that right. <laughs> um, it can be a bit more complicated your head around. If you can see this, like this plug board uh, on here at the top, you know, the top left in green, you can select between lots of different resistors. And uh, I'm not sure what the middle one is. Um, I don't know what the middle one is. I can see at the bottom, bottom in green, um, it looks like they've got some like logic gates. So it's fairly basic. You know, it's probably an M0 minus, minus, minus. But this is how they did stuff back in the day. You would basically wire up where you wanted the signals to go. So you, you could do integration, differentiation, um, you know, you, you could work out different different sums um, in the analog world. And the beauty of doing it in analog is <clears throat> it's super low power. So whereas in the digital, you know, you might be drawing, you know, 10 to 100 milliamps, you could be down at a handful of microamps. So when we're talking about things being battery operated, um i still think um the analog stuff has got a huge amount to offer but it is more complicated to get your head around and i've got an example of um, the sort of things that you can do so let's dive in shall we so this is an example of the sort of thing you could do as an analog coprocessor so this is a filter and there's a ton of different filters my favorite is the Chevy Chev. Uh, it's, it's got a really nice high frequency roll off. Um, this is what's called a two pole. And as you can see, uh, there's the equation there. Uh, if you're wondering where this all came from, I always say don't worry too much about derivations. Just if you've got something like Horowitz and Hill, um, every good engineer should have this. It's a wonderful coffee table book. Uh, I think it's 70 quid from all good retailers. Um, that's where I've got this circuit from. Um, you can always find the equations and then you can just manipulate them to whatever you want. Uh, I think the hardest thing with analog um, processing is you know you've got a problem to solve. It's just how do I go about it? And I've just grabbed some of my books here. Um, this is one of my books on op amps um it's about 690 odd pages of op amp goodness uh it's a genuine eyesight test 
but there is, there is a circuit in here using op amps for every occasion, something for everybody. Um, but it does show me that I generally do need glasses to read this book. Um, it is too small print for my eyes. So um, one thing I will say that it, if you're then do, if you are doing analog signal processing, and then you're going to put it ultimately into the processor chip, of course, don't forget that a lot of signal processing is going to be um, plus minus signals. And of course, um, putting a plus minus, certainly a minus signal, I should say, into a microprocessor on the ADC, the analog digital conversion, it might not be very happy about it. It may cloud the signal and not, and not work properly. So you might have to have some, what we call a DC offset, where rather than being say plus one volt and minus one volt, you might just have to lift it up. So it could be say biased at 1.5 and then go up to say sort of 2.5 and down to 0.5, if that makes some sense. In this example here, and this is a circuit I've actually used, but I can tell you it works. I'm actually using a uh, U2 and that diode and that R, uh, R5C3 um, just there on the right hand side. That's there just to create like an yeah. envelope. Um, if I've not done any of the, the good old days of radios with AM, we had the carrier frequency and then we had altitude modulation, if anyone remembers that. And you just use something like this just to to pick off the amplitude of the signal. So this is just like a little bit of smoothing, just so you don't end up when you go into the ADC of having a sampling problem. So I guarantee that would work. This is a two pole filter. I say, uh, if you get Horace Hill, I'm just looking at it here, it's page 408, just looking at that right there. But of course, if we're doing machine learning, we're gonna want to adjust the um, parameters of our filter. Since machine learning is all about, I've got a signal coming in, I've done something to get a signal out, whatever it may be, say a filter, and then I'm gonna want some feedback at some point in time to adjust the filter. So how would I do that in this kind of situation? Whereas, you know, when we saw what we, um, <coughs> that plug board thing, you'd be moving wires around, but of course, if we've got something on our bench, we don't really want to be doing that. We want to be a little bit more modern than that. And there's a dead easy way to do that. And it's simply to use something like this, which is a Digipot. And they're, they're about one pound 30 each, something like that. I, I looked up this one earlier. It's available um, in reasonable volume, about one pound 50. <clears throat> so um, just a, have a look at what these things, how these things work. Yeah, yeah, we do have obviously VDD and ground, which is power. CS is a chip select and the little bar over the top means it's active low. So, um, so for every one of these that you'd have in your circuit, you'd have to have a chip select to it. And then the ink line uh, with the line, that's actually to um, like an incremental counter. So, for every falling edge, this is a falling edge triggered device, say a clock signal, it would either change the resistor up in, um, the, you've got 32 steps, this one here anywhere at any rate, which means if it's a 50K <coughs> hot between H and L, high and low, then you'd have 1K5 um, sort of steps. So it's, it's, it's like a, a digitally tunable, resistor and of course you then got um that u and d whether you want it to go up or down you can get other ones which you've got maybe got spi or i2c you'd probably pay a bit more money for those so obviously the limitation of these cheaper ones are you kind of need to know where you are but if you do know where you are and you could easily track that in a program uh you might have to periodically reset it i don't know um, I reckon that would work. And I did a little circuit diagram here so we can see exactly um, how would you wire it in? Well, look, on our filter, I reckon you'd then want to. 
So <clears throat> I don't think that would be too hard to wire up. I think the one thing to be wary of, and it's caught me out when I first drew this circuit, is obviously the H and the low, because you want those two resistors, certainly in this filter configuration, to be exactly the same. And if you've got your H and your low, you wrong way around on one of them, then you, you'd get some weird filtering effect. It just wouldn't be what you expect it to, to look like. Um, let's say some examples of that. The, the stuff which I've done, I did recently, which, um, I think well, was it last time or the time before, <clears throat> I was doing some audio stuff. Uh, I didn't have this Maxim device plumbed into it, but I did have this filter circuit so it was such an easy way just to offload from the main processor um, the filtering because if you want to get to digital filtering apart from doing averaging if you want to get something that's slightly more sophisticated the mass can get quite heavy and i'm really not sure an m0 plus um could actually do fast Fourier transforms i don't know if anyone's tried I guess that's a no. Um, I, I do know that um, it has been achieved for moderate sized FFT, sort of like oh, really? 500 oh. to 1,000 points. Um, so if, if, uh, there you go. So if it's to 1,000 points. Use, using integer math rather than floating point math. Yeah. So if you, if you, if you, if you did 1,000 points, that's um, so that's then what, about 500 hertz. So well, it if you, depends on your frequency bandwidth. Yeah, so if you're doing audio, you might have a problem. So anyway, so um, with, with that in mind, that's just an example. As I say, um, I've got the details of this book in just a second. Um, so anyone wants to grab it, uh, it wasn't too expensive. I looked at the prices all earlier. Everything's reasonably priced. Uh, you then want to plumb that, of course, then into your um, your uh close that uh in, in your raspberry pi pico so it would actually be dead easy just to plumb the output of that but not the negative voltage so make sure you handle that one um into you know one of the one of the three adc ports and then you can just just easily read so no drama at all dead easy to do and i think it just offloads a whole load of programming headaches although like i say uh, it is analog electronics and uh, that can be a bit daunting i appreciate that um i i have a suggestion um and please correct me if you think i'm wrong Stephen, because i might be wrong but um if if you were to use those pots in the way that you're suggesting in that diagram um it might be a good idea to make sure that you've got resistors between the C1, C2 point and, and the output. Otherwise oh. you're going to get a perfect feedback. Right, okay. Um, you have to be right. However, um, the wiper W on the digipot does have a resistance. And I think on these ones, these these ones here, um, it's something like four hundred ohms. Mm, okay. Nothing's ever perfect. The, um, the circuit diagram on the on the block suggests that you can just do short, which. Uh, no, um, it it does look like you could do that. Um, if 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 you pick through the data sheets, um, it it does say that there is a there is a resistance parasitic mm -hmm. resistance um more, more most likely uh on the on the w so no you, you can't have a short circuit with the digipots mm -hmm. so you, you absolutely got to take that in, into account um in a design the other thing that was going through my head although i'm a lot less sure about it is put the vdd input for any of these chips you use on something like a GPIO output, potentially with any <coughs> enhanced. Right, okay. Um, so that you actually have control over the power and can therefore do things like reset them. 
Yeah, well, there is, obviously there is a chip, the chip select line to reset these. Uh, I will also say, um, as, as a sort of a rule of thumb, um, when it comes to controlling um, analog circuitry, obviously you need to make sure that if you've got the power supply in the middle, let's say here, that you've got the digital one side and you've got the analog the other side. Don't You don't want to have, you know, your power and then digital and then analog or worse still power supply analog digital it's much better to have the power supply in the middle and then split off the power out very often the power supply is always overlooked and assumed to be super duper simple and so many designs that i've inherited <laughs> in my career where no thought at all has been given to the power supply and it, it's almost like an afterthought, like product approvals and EMC. And of course, guess what? The thing doesn't work properly. And I see it so many times. The, the reason I was, well, unless there's a specific mechanism, chip select wouldn't normally do a reset of the device. Perhaps there is a specific mechanism here. Um, you know what? You'd, you'd have to check the data sheets. Yeah. Anyway, uh, very carefully. I'll, I'll um, you know that the. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a valid point. Uh, one, yeah, you've got to check the data sheets carefully, and and certainly when it comes to power supply, so if you're going to do some analog processing, you know, uh, I would always have a separate power supply for my analog to what I'd have for my digital. Uh, I, I I would never use the same one because you're just going to introduce noise into your analog circuitry. So it's one to be very wary of. Anyway, um, right, just, just before we, uh, <clears throat> I go and, go and cough quietly for a minute. Um, so uh, if you want to do the add some analog stuff, uh, I can recommend this book. Um, this was, I think about 32 pounds. I'm pretty sure I got it off Amazon. Uh, it is kind of small print, but it's the ISB num N number down there. Um, but you know, you can always find a, a friendly person that makes space or drop me a mail if if uh, if you're struggling with that, of course. And of course, Horrocks and Hill, everyone knows Horrocks and Hill. Um, if you're not an engineer, you just still have a copy of that, is my view. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 quite a weighty tome, isn't it? Um, I think someone said you can get you can get something like uh, Greg, did you, did you say about 120 pages you can download as the samples? It seems to be 119. So 119, right. The first few pages, but it's a, it's a rough idea what you get anyway. It's uh, I personally highly recommend it. Um, so it's now the third edition. I thought there might be a fourth edition, but um, I've, got, I've got the third edition here. And uh, they have updated it. You know, when I was at university, um, you know, it, it didn't have all the chips. It it, it it talked about you know transistors a lot. Um, you know, and they had sort of pictures of chips with legs everywhere. Uh, now they've moved on a little bit in that book. Right. Okay. Look, I'm going to have a two minute break. If that's all the same to you, um, <clears throat> by all means, just whilst I go and. Uh, grab a glass of water and just get my voice back. Um, you can always just hop onto the, onto the link there and just, uh, just grab um, uh, the, the slides. Right, I'm just gonna go and get a glass of water. Talk amongst yourself for a minute, get a plate of biscuits, glass of milk, recharge your minds. <laughs>
Yeah. Right, that worked for me. <clears throat> right, okay, everybody. Um, I've got a new book here. I got given a voucher. Um, so I went into town. I haven't looked at it in any detail yet, but it's on Python. Um, here it is. Um, it was only £26. I found it in Waterstones. It's on the top floor, um, right at the back where where all the nerdy books are. <laughs> and and uh, it, it does, so I haven't really looked at it in any detail yet, but I had a quick flip and say I had a £25 voucher, so it cost me a pound, which I thought was worth a punt. <laughs> and I, I, I will plough through this, um, but by all means, go and treat yourself. I don't think it's too bad. It's got a lot of stuff in here on different algorithms and stuff. And since it's Python, and which is basically micro Python, and uh, and the Raspberry Pi, you know, is uh, Python for Thony, uh, you could certainly um, make maybe find it useful. So, bit of a bit of a bookwormathon, isn't it? In fact, talking of bookwormathons, I've got another book here. Um, I got this one off Amazon. Someone sent me a video of uh, yesteryear's technology. It's one of these BBC programs, and uh, you know they, they, they had all the all the things that I wanted as a kid, but never had, like a big track. Uh, and uh, they they held this book up, so I thought, right, I'm going to get that book and have a look at it. And let me just share with you before we carry on. This is 1984. Yeah. And um, this is what they had to say in 1984 about artificial intelligence, basic being um, on the BBC, of course, or Commodore Pet or whatever. And they write in 1984, I think this is quite insightful. Uh, artificial intelligence is a very interesting subject. However, there is a tendency to talk about AI rather than do AI. And I just thought, you know what? Nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Four, 39 years, nearly 40. And I thought, that's, that's exactly what they, they, they were saying is like 40 years ago. And I still hear people talk about it. Anyway, I can hear my cat wanting to come in, but she'll have to go around the back. My cat um, actually knocks at the front door. She goes, <laughs> out, she goes out the back and then goes around the front of the bungalow and then knocks on the front door or taps on the window. So, um, there you go. Here's some scratching. Um, it's not someone in the basement. It's the cat wanting to be let in. Right. Anyway, look, that was analog electronics uh, for co-processing. I thought for the second half here, we'll have a look at maybe the digital side of it and how to wire up a second Raspberry Pi Pico. So it's not as straightforward as what you might think. <laughs> What I will say is you can't just buy two Raspberry Pi Picos and stick them together and have one doing, you know, all the main thinking stuff and the other one doing, say, the processing. There's a little bit more to it from an electronics perspective. And just to give you an idea, what I've grabbed here is, let's say we wanted to connect two together. Um, <clears throat> what you'd have to do is disable one of the two power supplies here, because if I just circle those two here, if you stuck them both together, it might work, it most probably would, but having two power supplies staring at each other, both trying to drive, might not be a very good idea. Um, there could be a fight on its hands. So what we need to do is find some way to basically I would say the co-presser sensor one, we want to switch that power supply off and we want to power the Pico from the other 3.3 volts. So as luck would have it, there is a signal called 3V3N for enable. So all you have to do to disable it, and I've tried it and it works, and I'll show you in a few moments on the bench, is just pull that signal low. And uh, there it is up there, you can see. So you can just put a bridge between those two pins 
and jobs are good. And, and the only other thing I would probably suggest to do would be on the reset, I would make, and I'll show you the wang just a second, I would want to make the main processor um, reset or control the reset of the coprocessor, if that makes some sense. So it's always good when you've got all these things to have like a master reset, rather than having things of multiple resets going on, which is why when I came up with this architecture, which is my proposal for how we can use the Pico, I've got an auxiliary reset. So the end resets what comes into the um, processor chip. And the end reset is actually just a, uh, one of the GP lines, GPIO lines. And I've just assigned it to be an auxiliary reset. So there is method in the madness. So let me show you how would I, this is just the basic wiring. So uh, I think it's a good idea as well to knock off the um, five volts on one of them um, because the five volts is what powers the switch mode power supply which is the on the top right of the board you can see there are um right, i should be able to do is put the pointer on if i put the laser pointer on hopefully you can see that there we go so this is the this is the um switch mode power supply chip here this is just two deep power decoupling bulk capacitors and this here, which I'm just pointing at, hopefully you can see, that's the um, uh, inductor for the power supply. And this power supply is good for about, I think about 300 milliamps. Uh, and then this is the diode. So I would suggest, uh, because this five volts actually does power all of this, and again, I don't think it's a very good idea to have power supply staring at each other. Um, I would disconnect this five volts and of course, just use this one here um, of the main one. And so you just put a short link across there, easy peasy. And then the output from here, this then becomes a power input because you've disabled this bit of circuitry. Simples. And then the auxiliary reset, as I label it, wires straight to the, this reset on here. Uh, you could actually get away with not using this reset if you really wanted to, but I always think it's a good idea to have a master reset control just so when things go wrong or you know if your program hangs, you can get everything nicely synchronized. So that's why I do it that way. Excuse me. Right, dig in a little bit more. Um, so with that in mind, how could we connect the two together? Well, there's a number of ways you could do it, and I think whichever way you went would really just depend on <clears throat> your application. So a simple way is just to do some handshaking. So you could have a boatload of processing going on in the coprocessor. And uh, it could just be like a, a threshold that it reached a certain level, like last week, last month rather, we were looking at proximity. So it could just be a proximity alert. So you might not want to send a complicated signal to the main processor. Could just be a, yeah, I'm at this level. And of course, some handshaking each way. So that would be a dead easy way to do it. And if I was trying to get something working to start with, I might very well start with that approach. Slightly more complicated, of course, um, is you could use the NSDSPI bus or the I2C. But just remember um, to have a, you have a master and you have a slave. That is to say that you wouldn't want both to be, to be what's called a multi-master you want to be very careful with that because you wouldn't want both the main one and the coprocessor trying to drive the clock line or because this is MISO which is master in slave out 
and master out slave in. So it's dead easy to wire the mozzy to the mozzy and the miso to the miso, which is why it's uh, why it's called that, because it's just easy to go one to one. It's pretty straightforward. So um, again, I think it's just whatever your application is, you know, don't overthink it. Uh, we will, in a future episode, spend a bit more time looking at the SPI and the I2C because I think that does warrant a bit of time on its own. But what I was just going to finish off with us today was in Thony. Um, yep. Your diagram doesn't show the grounds being... Join. No, it's a bit naughty off me. Um, yeah, you, you would. Um, it would get a bit cluttered if I started connecting all the grounds, but you're absolutely right. You would you would excuse me, you would connect all these grounds together. Absolutely. Yes. Um yeah. I mean, I, I meant just having one connected just to show that they're on the same naught volt ground level. Yeah, yeah, okay. Signals, otherwise, it can get a bit crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I I, could have drawn those in. I didn't think to, if I'm honest with you. Um, okay, um, yes is the answer. What I will say as well, actually, don't forget that if you are then connecting these two together, is to make sure that, um, you know, you don't end up defining, you know, the GPO pins to be an output on each one. If one's an output... The other one's got to be an input or it's got to be a floating. Um, yeah. The, the other thing, which I will say as well, actually, if you were to have these on separate 3v3 power supplies, uh, <laughs> I have discovered that the Pico is not tolerant to voltages on the GPIO pins that are above the supply rail, it will cause the chip to hang. So there's, there's a, it's a silicon level issue for sure. So even if you had say 3.3 volts for the main and say 3.4 volts for the coprocessor, for example, and think, well, that's within tolerance, surely. I've actually found that the higher voltage feeding into the, say from the coprocessor to the main, or even the other way, would actually cause the chip to hang. And you look at the code and you think, well, my code's fine. Why is it hung? And it's because of voltage um, incompatibilities. Is that a good phrase? One to watch, voice of my experience. Right, the last thing I was going to show you, and we'll, 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 we'll jump out of this slide fest, and was, was how to use Thony for multiple um, um, PICOs. It is possible, could be slightly better documented how to do it, but um, I'll show you, we'll pop out of this, and we'll just load up Thonny, um, because what we should be able to do, um, just in case it doesn't work, I'll tell you now, just in case it goes wrong, is at the top menu bar, you'll see tools, then you'll, you'll scroll down to options, that'll open this window, and then in this window, you'll see the tab interpreter. And within that, uh, you then get to select which of your two PICOs you want. And of course, as we'll discover in a moment, um, you need to know which is five and which is eight. So that, that can be a bit of a juggle. Anyway, uh, let me show you. I stop sharing. Fingers crossed this all goes amazingly well. Um, boom, 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 Thonny, here it is. This is what we want. Right. Um, that's not, is that share? No, let's get rid of that. Hang on, everybody. Right. Fingers crossed, y'all can see Thonny. That's a yes, I hope. Yes, we can. Oh, thanks. 
I always worry with this because the other issue which happens with um, my, my computer setup here is that it drops the internet connection. Um, and I'm, I'm there, end up talking to myself for far too long before I realize it, it's all gone pear shaped. But anyway, <clears throat> right. So, what we do is, in fact, I'm going to do a bit of camera gymnastics here because I've planned this, everybody. Camera gymnastics. So, if I pop that on there and that on there. There you go. So uh, might be back to front. I'm not sure. Right. So I think hopefully you can see uh, it might be the right or left on where I am, but I think the cameras reverse the image. Um, yeah. On the right hand side, you've got the. Um, this is my main processor, this one here, and this is my co-processor here, and I've got them both plugged into the USB. And then on the screen here, hopefully on the big screen, um, to work out which is which, and this is my little trick, because it's it's not straightforward at all, this. You go to Tools, Options, and hopefully you can still see all of this. It then says Interpreter, and then you have to try and guess which one it is. So I think 8 is my main one when I did my testing earlier. So what I've done, you can download this program. I've actually made it so you can actually select, you can actually run a little program that flashes the LED, because there's an LED on the um, Pico, the top letters and the little LED. So if I run this program, fingers crossed, an LED will start to flash. There we go. <clears throat> so I know eight is now um, my, my, my see, um, so COM8 is this one here. So I think I think you then need to get a borrow out um, because it's not terribly clear how you'd know which is which. Can I interject again? Yeah, totally. Windows is totally inconsistent on that point. Brilliant. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you have it running once, um, it might do it the same time the next time you you do it or it might not right okay um so your your best bet is to plug the the usbs in one at a time and then you you know you you know <laughs> you, you, yeah you know or or if you had it, it depends on how you had the whole thing wired up i suppose <coughs> um so then what you can do very easily is then go so that's flashing at one second intervals you can then go to the other one and I'll select COM5. Yep. And so now that's now selected the other one. But as you can see in the IDE, it's not terribly obvious, is it? Which which one you're talking at. So we'll check, we'll make this point one and zero point one. I'm sure there's other ways. If anyone's got another way of working this out, I'm all ears. But um, there you go, look, and then that's the other one. So Sony does allow you to swap between the um, your, your two different processors. And what I have done actually, because this is upside down, on the um, Pico, I'm not sure how well I can show you this. Um, I haven't got a picture of the reverse side, I should have thought about that. On the back of the Pico, so I was thinking, where are his other Picos? There are some test points on the back. Um, I'm not sure how well I can show you this. Sorry, Sylvan, are you showing anything on the camera? Like, a... uh, right, it's, it's, on, it's on my little camera of my one, the Zoom host. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I'd, I'd love to be able to work out how to do multi-screen oh. things. I minimise that, so I oh, <laughs> completely <laughs> didn't see that. Thank you. Right, do you want me to backtrack all of that? No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank You're you. You're okay. So, yeah, so um, there we go. So whilst, whilst you're looking at the Zoom host, there must... I, I, so I wanted to have two screens up, you see, to show you all. 
So uh, I can change the timing. So I could change this timing on here. If I want to change the other one, I'd have to go to say tools, for example. Then, yeah, and then I happen to know it's eight on this one here. Okay, right. And now hopefully this one, the main one on here will then start to flash a whole lot faster when I press run. There you go. I'm glad that worked. So it's, it's perfectly possible to connect multiple of these together and then you can just do some number crunching on this one, whatever it may be. And then you can just send the result through. Easy peasy. Took me a little while to work out how to do that. So as I say, what you can't do is just think, right, I'll stick them back to back and I'm off. Um, it uh, might work. I don't know. I don't one other, one other thing that might help in certain cases, at least, is that if you delve into now i'm going to talk about circuit python i suspect you can do the same with micro python but i couldn't tell you the file name in circuit python uh you you normally have a file called code.py which is your like main loop mm -hmm. if you have a boot.py that contains some stuff about startup and one of the things you can do there is to rename what the USB device calls itself when you when it starts up. <coughs> so you could call itself, you know, Pi One or and Pi Two or whatever, uh, and that will, you know, because it's in your boot.py, it'll persist. There you go. Um, I haven't played with Circuit I can't Python tell you what, what the MicroPython equivalent of boot.py is, but I would expect there is something. Um, yes, you, you can say programs as main.py and just squirrel it, you know, in, on, yeah, on in, here. In, 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 in MicroPython, main.py is what it starts off as. Right. In Circuit Python, it's called code.py. Oh, there um, we go. But that's not the file you change. The file you change is called boot.py in mm -hmm. Circuit Python. And dizzy it might be called boot.py in MicroPython or something else. But the point is, it's run way earlier than code.py or main.py. Oh, okay. I've got it's you. Not, I've it's got not you. in the same stream. And it's it's just for setting up things like USB. There you go. See, there's there's always more than one way to skin a cat, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, that's that's all I've got for you this this exciting month. So, um, 